Here you are. So glad you're here. Thank you. I want to, before I get into what I want to say to you today, uh, I echo the, the statements that have been made today about it's wonderful to walk in these doors. The fellowship, the love, the joy, the singing. It's all wonderful. We're so blessed to be here today. So blessed that God brought us together today. But where we're really, truly blessed, folks, is that we live in a nation where we're able to do this. Amen. Now, we just celebrated the 4th of July, so we're only going to act a bit of it. But America is not perfect, and we all know it. But I'm going to tell you something. It is still the greatest country that the world has ever known. Amen. And it's the that God has blessed us. So, let's do this. Oh, Far spacious skies forever rains of rain for purple mountains, majesty above the fruited plain, America, America, God shed his grace on thee. CNBC uh, just December of last year. It's the the uh, topic is this: youth suicide rates rose 62 percent from 2007 to 2021. People feel hopeless. One recent graduate said, "Young people dying by suicide has been an alarmingly frequent headline in recent years." Katie Meyer, a goalkeeper on the Stanford University women's soccer team died by suicide in 2022. She was 22 years old. Ian Alexander Jr., son of an actor and director, Regina King, killed himself last year. He was 26. In 2021, an eighth grade boy named Ellis Larabere took his own life after being told he couldn't return to the elite private school in Brooklyn, New York. He was currently attending. He was 13 years old. The last one is this. There was a boy in Houston who hung himself on a tree in his neighborhood and he left a note and said, this tree is the only thing that has roots around here. <coughs> My subject today is this. The search for <coughs> substance. The search for substance. You know, when I think about these things, it is only... You know, I want to talk to you about having roots because here in our subject it says, and he shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water. You know, there's two sides to having roots. There's a positive side. It's this. We have substance. We're rooted in something lasting. You can stand your ground. You can build mass. In fact, you know, somebody says, where are your roots? Well, my roots are back in Missouri. My roots are back in Texas. My roots are right here in Tennessee. And there's a lot of positive things to be said for that. But on the other hand, roots are also limiting. They limit freedom. They can find movement. You know the name, you may know, they know the name Tom Wolf. I don't mean Thomas Wolf of Look Homer and Angel fame, but I'm talking about the Tom Wolf, who was the writer of a couple of very popular novels. You remember it was made into a movie, a movie called The Right Stuff? He also wrote a, a novel and, which was made into a movie called The Bonfire of the Vanities. This is back in the 80s. But you know, he gave a speech at class day at Harvard back in 1988. And he said this, throughout human history, we've always sought two kinds of freedom. We've always sought, look for two kinds of freedom. Number one, freedom from tyranny, which means freedom of religion, which we just celebrated. 
Freedom of choice. Freedom of speech. Freedom of the press. That's freedom from tyranny. That's the first one. The second one we've always saw is freedom from all. That means the ability to feed my family, to work, have a job, these sort of things. We've always sought those two kind of freedoms. But in his speech, he said, we are now looking for a third kind of freedom. And he said, it's freedom from religion. He, he put it this way. It's freedom from that internal monitor that your parents put there or your preacher put there. This little monitor says, oh, you better not do that. And so we want to ride our own ground. It's the final freedom. And what is the result of that? Tom Wolfe said, it is rootlessness. Rootlessness. My roots, my family, my faith, my people. Now, in many ways, we've cut those ties. You know, our ancestors has, had less freedom. You know, I can even remember my father, especially my grandparents. I don't remember my grandparents ever going on a vacation. Ever. That just wasn't their thing. But now people have a lot more uh, extra money. They have things to go to sports games. We have a lot more freedom. But I would make this argument. I'm not sure we have less to spare. I'm not sure we have more substance than our ancestors did. So I just want to look at this. And the Bible says there is a, in fact, you know, I think about this tree rooted. I think about my West Texas root. We had a thing out there called a tumbleweed. <laughs> and those old tumbleweeds grew up. I had to, had to chop many of those old tumbleweeds. But I, I'll tell you something. Once they die, they just take up root and start blowing. Just blow across the road. And there's no cowboys on Drifting along with the tumble and tumble. Yeah, that sounds like freedom. That sounds like wonderful. But there's no root. There's no substance. And you know, the Bible says there is a rootlessness and a weightlessness in every culture that we have to push back against. You know, last week I talked about happiness. That's a very simple, straightforward thing. Just happiness. Are we really people who are, who are really happy and can stay happy? But today I want us to understand, first of all, the problem of this rootlessness. And you may think, well, I didn't come to church expecting to hear about substance and rootlessness, but I'm hoping that as I go along, you'll think, you know, that talks to me. That speaks to me. I hope it's something that will help you get through these next seven days until you're back here again. Now, here's what we want to do. I really want it to apply to me. Please give me a few minutes and just try to let me lay this out and see this about this modern problem with an ancient solution in Psalm chapter 1. And so I want to look, first of all, let's see how to understand the life of ruthlessness. And I think my next slide, uh, Bob, is the, yes, the life of Chad. <laughs> I want to say about the life of Chad. The, the Bible says here in Psalm 1, the ungodly are not so, but are like the Chad which the wind drives away. Here's the contrast. The, 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 the godly person has its roots. He's a tree with roots planted in something solid. It's got root. It's got standing. But the ungodly are not so. Now, this is an agricultural term. Now, if you've ever seen, Keith asked me this morning, I was going to go out and film at the Hermitage because there's a farm out there that was combining wheat, but we never got together. But if you ever watch somebody with a machine combining wheat, these, these tractors, these combines are amazing. They not only separate out everything, but they, they They've got the kernel, you know, in a wheat, you've got your main thing, which is the kernel, and it's got a husk around it. That husk is the chaff. Whenever that combine mixes it up, it throws the, the seed in one, in one bin, and it shoots the chaff out the back. And you'll see a combine going to the field, nothing but dust. Right? Dust, dust, dust. In the old days, they had to take a pitchfork, and they'd flip the wheat up in the air, and that kernel with the substance, the organic matter, would fall because it was heavier, and the chaff, the chaff would just blow away. So what is the life of chaff? That's what the Bible is trying to say. The life of chaff represents a life totally consisting of externals. It's symbolism over substance. There's no anchor. It's constantly being blown about by every wind of public opinion, every trend, even everyday problems of life. If, if some, you say, How, how'd your week go? Yeah, we, think, we do that. How'd your week go? Well, I had a little bit tough week. But folks who live a life of chaff, anything that comes into that life can just totally mess them up. Blown from every trend and every everyday problem. No roots. Now, let me, can I illustrate this for you? I'm talking about people without a core. Folks, we're talking about a core, a root. I'm, I'm in the 80s. <laughs> Some of the best movies, really, I think, were filmed in the 80s. You remember that there was a movie called Indecent Proposal? Star Robert Redford. Robert Redford, who's a millionaire, a billionaire, 
comes upon Woody Harrelson and Demi Moore, happily married. And he says to this couple, hey, if you let me sleep with her, I'll give you a million dollars. Now, we all would update this to, you know, 2024. He really would say something to us today. Hey, if you let me sleep with your wife, I'll give you $500 million. That's the lottery in space. You know what? That, that was a very popular movie. I remember going to watch that movie, and you know what? I was bothered. You know why I was bothered? Because I was asking, what would I do? What would I do? I mean, I could rationalize. I, I mean, I really thought, what and I'm doing the 500 million? What, what can I do for, with 500 million dollars? I could buy my kids, every one of my kids, a brand new car, and I'd never have to go pick them up or have them towed again. <laughs> so much for this church. That 500 million could do so much good. And I could rationalize it and rationalize it and rationalize it. And then the Bible says a life of root. Is there something in your life that's a root? That no matter what comes along, you have a core that says no matter the circumstances, I always will do this. Hmm. That's tough. Is there anything under any circumstances that is always wrong? Anything rooted, anything that you've got rooted in your commitment that never changed, I'm going to be personal with Mike Sullivan. I just admire and love Mike Sullivan so much with Mike and Phyllis. And you know what I said to him this morning, and I, I'm not trying to embarrass him, but Phyllis is not here. She just didn't feel quite up to it. But I, I said, Mike, I'm going to tell you how much I love the way you take care of her. You know what he said? He said, well, we, we made that commitment a few years, you know, seven years ago. And we, we came to an understanding. And I said, but you know, Mike, these days, some people make a commitment until further notice. <laughs> right? But I tell you that, I said, Mike, I just want you to know, I noticed. I, I noticed. That's a commitment. Now, are there some things that you won't ever change? No matter what, this is my core. This is my center. And this is what the Bible is speaking to all of us. If not, then I'm living the life of chat. It's a husk. It's a shell. It's a shove. We're talking about sweet corn with walkers this morning. Mike and Michelle, uh, I'm sorry, Greg and Michelle. And uh, Dick's talking about how good his garden is. Dick, I'll give your address after the services today. He's got some sweet corn to, 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 to die for. But don't you love that old sweet corn? But in the, in the summertime, you're, you're shucking that corn. What do you do with that shuck? Throw it away. Throw it away. I had an old football coach that had this saying. I didn't know it. He'd say, Lie shuck. <laughs> And I had to ask my dad, what does that mean? <laughs> and he said, hey, back in those days before we had electricity, if you're going from one place to another, you take an old car shuck and light it, and that'd be your light. To, and you better hurry, because it's going to last. <laughs> it's going to burn out quick. But that's it. That, this life of chaff is like a, it's like a shuck. It's like a husk. It's a shell. And that's the life of chaff. And then it says the ungodly. I want to talk about the ungodly. Ungodliness versus wickedness. Now, I love, Bob, thank you. That's the old King James you threw up there today. And I appreciate that. Now, I, I grew up with the King James. And, you know, blessed is the man that walketh not in the council. The, the new translations say the wicked. But really, the old translation is the best. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the council of the ungodly. And why is that important? Because i got to tell you this. Wicked people, we know this. Wicked people are always ungodly. But, folks... Ungodly people aren't always wicked. You hear what I'm saying? I want you to understand that. Yes, wicked people are always ungodly, but ungodly people aren't always wicked. The roots of my soul are not in... What is ungodly? It means this. The roots of my soul are not in God. They're not in God. The roots of my soul are not in God. Someone can be an atheist and be ungodly. Someone can be agnostic and be ungodly. But someone can be a believer and still be ungodly. A believer whose roots don't go down into God. With Him as my source of life. And un ungodliness creates a life of chaff. It leaves God out of the picture. That's my point. What is ungodliness? It's just living your life without God in the picture. It's living your life and you wake up every day and you go through your things. You may do good things. You may do all these things. But God's not in the picture. And that's why I want you to understand that the difference between wickedness and and ungodliness. And there's some things that this ungodliness creates, and I'll go through these quickly. 
First of all, ungodliness creates intellectual instability. Now, I want to contrast this uh, and this consistency with built on Christian principles. Now, here's what I want to say. This intellectual confusion. Folks, do you realize that we Christians, if, if, if I were to look at your diary, if you had a diary, in 3,000 years, and you're a Christian, and you're writing down your daily thoughts and devotion, someone 3,000 years from now could go, wow, that's my brother. That's my sister. It's so consistent. You know, uh, Jerry sends out a little blog with Oswald Chambers. I think Oswald died in 19, not, he was a, 1917. He was a Scottish preacher, a chaplain in World War I, but they published his book, My Utmost for His Highest, in 1927. And every time you read Oswald Chambers from 100 years ago, over 100 years ago, he's still fresh. Every day is fresh because God's Word doesn't change. God's Word is the root. It's not the chaff. It's got meaning. It's got weight. And so that's what's wonderful about it. You can read this and say, that's my brother. That's my sister. That's the intellectual stability. But notice what the Bible says. The ungodly are not so. Any intellectual system that leaves God out is just a revolving door. We see that all. Everything you're reading in the newspaper or seeing on the internet that says this is the way 40 years from now will be different. It changes like the chat. It just blows away. And so there's that. It, this ungodliness creates intellectual instability. It also creates social and personal instability. Now, I, 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 I have referred to Frederick Nietzsche many times, probably in a negative way. Because, yes, he was very influential uh, in some negative ways. But I'll tell you something that he did say that was so right. He said this, and I'm paraphrasing. When God dies, and of course he was the one that said God is dead. But he said this, when God dies in Western society, and he wasn't happy about it. He said, when God dies in Western society, all things become weightless. Weightless. He said that over 100 years ago. He's talking about being hollow. The city. And you know, you'll know this. Everything's weightless. Everything. Uh, I love. I love music, as you know. Now, I, I was born in 1961, so I didn't really hear all the music of the 60s movement. But I heard it afterward in some ways. What's the, what's so funny about it? I love them. I love the music. I love the mamas and the papas. But one of their songs was "Go Where You Want to Go." You got to go where you want to go, do what you want to do with whoever you want to do it with. And there was a slogan, if it feels good, do it. But, you know, and I don't want to put it down. Stephen Stills wrote a great song about, in fact, I just heard it yesterday, you know, you better stop, children, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down. Boy, you talk about pressure. Listen to the words. There's battle lines being drawn. Nobody's right if everyone's wrong. Young people speaking their minds, getting so much resistance from behind. Yeah. He also wrote this book, Love the One You're With. Hey, if you're a boy, she's a girl, love the one you're with. That all speaks to this weightlessness that Nietzsche was talking about. If there's no higher authority, if there are no Ten Commandments, there's no absolute truth. It's just our oneness. And there's creates a social and personal problem. You don't, you don't think that the that the lack of, of rootless or the lack of roots is affecting our country. <coughs> I heard the news this week, and I don't know what restaurant it was in. I'm going to say it was down in the gulch. And a, and a woman was sitting there at a table, and her chair was here, and there was somebody here with another chair. And, you know, she thought about it afterwards. She said, I remember that I looked over my shoulder, and that chair was just a little bit closer. And then I looked away, and then the next, next thing I knew, it was a little bit closer. She had her purse on the arm of the chair. And someone kind of worked their way back and stole her credit card. She got a notice within about 30 minutes. Someone had spent $4,000 at the after school. What is that? It's called go where you want to go. Do what you want to do. To whomever you want to do it to. That's the weightlessness that we're receiving in our society today. It's just that. And I've got to be honest with you. It's created a lack of trust. I think, I think people in America trust people less than ever before. I, I think you trust preachers less. <laughs> I get that. I think we, we certainly trust politicians less. We, I don't even think we trust the doctors anymore, folks. I really don't. How many times through all this 
told and stuff. We were told this and told this and told. And a lot of them were just simply lies. And I think this idea of ruthlessness affects even our social and psychological, social and personal life. And this, the final thing, not only does it, does it affect uh, intellectual ability and social and personal things, but it also creates what I want to say is a psychological instability. I really think that's true because if there's no core, my life becomes a series of masks. A series of masks that I wear. I'm reading, I'm about to finish up the book about Hitler. You know, and I, Hitler is a caricature for most of us. He just represents evil, but you know, he's more than that. He was very wise, he was very crafty, he knew what he was doing. But you know what this book tells me? The thing I got out of Hitler was a great actor. He could put on a mask for whatever the situation required. And folks, that's what many people do when they're living the life of chat. They just put up a front. Whatever the mask requires, whatever the situation requires, that's where we can go and be. And this is what the Bible says. The ungodly are that way, but the godly are not so. The tree planted by the river. So there's an understanding of the problem of rootlessness. Can I, can I give you some solutions? Before I do, I want to offer an invitation. And I don't mean to stand and come down from right in that context. I want to offer an invitation to every single one of us. Because what I've been talking about this morning is something that affects me, that I'm convicted of. Folks, everyone, every single person in this room is affected by this ruthlessness that's in our culture. That is creeping in and causing us to just blow with the wind, whatever it might be. People are blowing from marriage to marriage, from church to church, wherever the winds may blow. Because they feel no and have no before, no root. And you know, we don't use the word chat anymore. One of the words we use is fluid. Even gender has become fluid. So my invitation to you and me is this. Uh, the, the privilege I have of preaching to you is this. I have to study it and I have to get convicted. And then I, sometimes I say, how are you going to get up there and tell these people when you're doing the very same thing? I'm confessing to you, but I want to say to everybody an invitation to come to Jesus Christ because he's the only thing that has roots. He's the only thing that has roots. And I want to tell you what the gospel is. I want to give you a solution. But all of us today, I want you to understand we're being pressured in this rootless society. Chat. It's chat. And the Bible says this is the, the type of people who want to be. So here's the solution. How can we live a life of substance? This hollowness is creeping in on us. There's pressure. There's all kind of pressure. What's the answer? And the answer is the difference between the tree and chap. I don't even know what I put up there. Did I put anything else up there? Okay, here it is. We must be rooted in God's truth. What do I mean? The difference between the chap and the tree. The chap is connected to nothing. Connected to absolutely nothing. But the tree, look, listen to this. The tree is connected to something beyond itself. It sinks its roots into something outside itself. We must be rooted in God's truth. Why do I say that? Because there is, uh, I'll explain. Uh, I want to show you a parallel. The parallel is this. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and he'll be like a tree planted by rivers of water. How's he a tree? How's he planted? His delight is in the law of the Lord. This tree has sunk its roots into God's truth. God's truth. You remember, does anybody recall the rock opera written by Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice called Jesus Christ Superstar? There were some great songs from that. But you know, I'll tell you the one part that I went back and watched was Jesus' encounter with Pilate in this rock opera called Jesus Christ Superstar. When, when Jesus said that he'd come to reveal the truth, here's what Pilate says in the musical. And what is truth? Is truth unchanging law? We both have truths. Are mine the same as yours? Folks, that, that's our society today. Any truth. You've got your truth. I've got mine, but there's no absolute truth. Remember weightlessness? God alone has glory. And that Hebrew word for glory is weight. Because he has no beginning and he has no end, God alone has substance. Everything else is fleeting. Everything else is fading. Everything else is passing away. Even, even the good things. Now, let me tell you something. I'm going to read you something because uh, when I'm going through my emails at work or even on my personal email, 
But especially at work, if every once in a while I get um, noticed that someone in our organization has lost family, might be their father, might be their mother, might be their grandmother, and they always em emphasize sympathy. But you know what I do? If there's a link to the obituary, I always go. And I make it a policy. I, I, I follow Yogi Berra's philosophy. He said this, you should always go to other people's funerals. Otherwise, they won't come to yours. <laughs> Are you with me? <laughs> Am I going too fast? I don't know. I, don't know. I think that's a funny book. You know, uh, this, this one just came in. I'm not going to read any names or locations. I'm going to show you the difference between the true life of the tree and the chaff. Even something good, even something good, if it's not rooted in God, is fleeting, passing away. This person was born January 13, 1941. Here's what it says. This is his obituary. He was born with an innate sense of humor and a generous spirit. He made everyone feel special. I wish I knew him. Whether you were family, friend, or new acquaintance, you quickly became a part of his world, and to know him was to love him. Oh, I do wish I knew him. Beyond his humor, he was a man of great integrity and kindness. He dedicated his life to his family, teaching us the values of love, respect, and resilience. Resilience. Who couldn't like that? We all love that. Here we go. While our hearts ache with his loss, we find solace in the countless memories we share. His spirit lives on in the stories we tell. The laughter we share and the love that binds us. How long will that last? How long will that last? Jack leaves behind, Jack leaves behind a legacy of love, having touched countless lives with his kindness and humor. Though he is no longer with us, his spirit will live on in the laughter he inspired and the love he shared. Folks, that's all good. But can I tell you, because there's no mention of any faith in Jesus Christ, anything at all, it's chaff. It's chaff. It's so good that this man loved and laughed and all this sort of thing. But anything that is not connected to God is passing away. Amen. And we live our lives and we say, he'll live on in our memories. Yeah, as long as those memories last and then he'll be gone. So, Christianity. Christianity offers a life of <laughs> tree planting of roots. And so, let me just say this. Remember that way this God alone has glory. Only everything, everything else is fleeing and passing away. Everything except the degree that is connected to Him. You know, again, we just had a celebration of Francis Cummings' life. We can, we can say Francis loved and laughed. We can say Francis taught us so many things. We'll, we'll be of loving his memory, but you know what's lasting? It's his faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what lasts. That's why we can celebrate this year, because he had a faith rooted in Jesus Christ, which does not pass away. It does, it is not believe. And so I almost understand that. So let me say this. That God's, God's law connects me to what is real. So I was talking about God's law this morning, and it, it gives us, and it's, it's not so much the fact that God's going to get you for that, that sort of thing. But, you know, disobeying God causes me to be, be less real. God's law is real. God's law is real. Yeah. When it says don't lie, don't steal, don't cheat, don't do these things, that's, it's like the laws of nature, the laws of physics. If I drop something, it's, gravity says it'll fall. And God's spiritual law says if you do these things, it'll hurt you. You'll be less than. You'll be hollow. Every time I lie, Every time I cheat, every time I steal, every time I, whatever it is, it's just a little more hard. Only God's word is real like that. And that, that's it. If, if I break that, it'll break me. If I break God's law, it'll break me. And here's the last point here. Not only must be born uh, rooted in God's truth, but born again by God's truth. Let me read to you what I mean. This is 1 Peter one twenty three. For you have been born again. Not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. Through the living and enduring word of God. Folks, it's not just abstract. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not do. Thou shalt not do. You shall do. No, it's taking that and being letting it cause us to be born again. And see the last thing? He goes on to quote Isaiah. All people are like grass. 
and their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. How do I find that? How? Born again into God's truth. It's grabbing the right end of the stick. It's grabbing the right end of the stick. You, you know, our, when I grow up, said, you better grab the right end of that snake. <laughs> Don't grab that tail. That's what Moses did, but I never grabbed the tail. Grab the right end of the stick. You know what the right end of the stick is for us? It's the gospel. It's the gospel, and that's where I'll end this morning. It is the gospel. What is it then? When it says, he shall be like a tree planted by the river of water. Trees don't get planted. Don't, I mean, some trees don't volunteer. But this tree was planted. It was planned out. It was planted in the right place. You don't make yourself a Christian. I don't make myself a Christian. I become a Christian when I accept the work that Jesus Christ has done for me. In that faith. In that faith. And by the way, uh, I told you I, I grew up you know, West Texas, 15 miles from a little town called No Trees. That's exactly that's true because we had no rain, uh, and and you know we had some rain but in the days of his that works. I'll never forget my, my buddy worked at a truck stop one summer uh, before he went off to college, and this big Winnebago pulled in there to, to get gas, and these people were from Michigan or something. And my, this back in the day when he actually got service, my buddy was filling up their tank and washing the windshield, taking their tires, and this fella from Michigan said, "Wow, it sure is dry around right here." He says. Uh, how much rainfall y'all get a year? And my buddy said, oh, about nine inches. He said, wow, it's not very much. And my buddy said, you'd have thought it was a whole lot the day we got it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not the truth out there, you know. It comes like that. But you know what? When I came up here, I started learning about trees. I had to. It was my job. I, I didn't know that much about trees, but every time I said, what is that tree? What is that tree? You know what? The Bible's not too... The Bible's not giving us a contrast between a big old pin oak. We got some hackberries growing out here. A big old pin oak or a hackberry and a dogwood. It's not the difference between the two PA oak and the red bud. This is the tree versus the. You see the difference? It's all around us, folks. It's pressuring in on us. It's coming in on us every time. And we've got. With the, with the gospel, we, we push back against that chap to say, I want to plant my life in Jesus Christ because he lived the life I should have lived and he died the life I should have died. And now because of him, I can be accepted. And you know what? When they read my obituary, I don't know how many good things you're going to say about how much I learned to love or inspired laughter, but I hope they say, and I know they'll say, he's with Jesus because he put his faith and trust in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And that's what I'm inviting all of us to do today. To give our lives. Because he loves us so much and what he did for us. Trust in that loving, saving work of Jesus Christ. Mark, let's stand and say.